In Godot, everything you make is built from scenes and nodes. Now a scene is like a container, and nodes are the individual parts inside of it that each do a single job. A mesh for visuals, light for illumination, or a collider for physics. And you put them together, and you have the building blocks of your game. So for example, imagine a workbench that the player can interact with. One node would handle the mesh so it's visible, and then another would detect when the player walks into range, and then one more would stop the player from walking right through it. Now each node does its own simple task, but you put them together and they're formulating the complete object. So in this lesson, you'll create your first level scene, and then add a ground, and set up the player character with a camera, and then of course, save it all in a way that's ready for scripting. Let's jump in and make the first scene, which is the level that we're going to build up throughout this series. So to do that, we can click on 3D scene, which is going to create a new scene that's effectively a container that has a top level node 3D. Now, what we can do is rename this. We'll call it level 01. And then also, let's just get saving out of the way. So control S or scene save and we'll call it level 01. That way we can see of our progress as we go. Now we're gonna add a child node to the scene that's going to represent the ground. This node is gonna have what's known as a static body 3D, or rather that's the type that it's going to be, which is used for objects that don't move, but still need to participate in collisions like uh, walls, floors, terrain, things like that. So to do that, you can right click and go to add child node. And this is going to bring up a rather lengthy list within the Node Explorer. And this is effectively a big library of all the different kinds of nodes that you can use for different purposes. Now, if you search for static, you're going to find the static body 3D. And this node actually inherits from several other nodes. You can see here, physics body 3D, collision object 3D, and then node 3D. And that just basically means that it's built on top of them and then inherits their functionality for free. Now, every node has a description, which is this box down below, and it's pulled in automatically from the documentation. So you can click on any of the links here to get more details on what the node does. You can also tell that there is the hierarchy of inherited nodes too. So you can dive into what say collision object 3D does. Now we're going to add this by hitting the create button and then go ahead and rename this to ground. Now you can see here, there is a warning. And what you'll find as you're working with nodes in Godot is that in some cases, they expect something from you in order to function or something in the scene in order to function. So in this case, the static body 3D node is expecting that there's a collision shape node underneath it. Sometimes they'll flag that they expect a property to be set in the inspector. Now, before we resolve the configuration warning, let's actually add the ground so we can see what it looks like. So once again, right click and go to add child node. But in this case, let's add a mesh instance 3D. And what this is going to do is this is going to let us visualize what the ground looks like. So in the inspector under mesh, click the drop down and choose box mesh. And then to set the right sizing of this, you can click on the box here and that's going to unfold several more properties. And let's set the size for this. So we're going to go 10.5 and 10. And that's going to let us have a ground that the player can actually walk on. Now that obviously didn't fix the warning. So we can go ahead and take care of that now by adding a collision shape 3D. So if you hit create, now you can see the warning on the top one is gone, but there's now a warning on the collision th shape 3D. And this is basically saying that it doesn't know what shape it should take in order to detect for collisions. So under the property, you can set the shape by clicking the drop down, and then we'll pick a box shape 3D. And if we zoom in kind of close, you can see there's this blue kind of bounding box right here. That is the properties that the box uh, is set to for the collision shape 3D. 
which obviously isn't quite correct because we want that to match what our ground looks like. So once again, you can click this box and it's gonna expand properties under that shape. And then we can change these properties to match what we just had. Oops, yeah, no, that's right. What we just had for the mesh instance. And it looks like, I think I might've gone, I did, I went 0.25. I was thinking 0.5 and my brain went 0.25 because that makes loads more sense anyway. So we'll fix that. So now they match and the ground is ready to go with a collider. So I'm gonna hit save again. And then one uh, more thing to talk about before we jump into the next part is the inherited notes. So I have the static body 3D selected. And if we come over to the inspector, you can kind of see there's these headers right here. These headers represent properties that are exposed through each one of the nodes that this static body 3D is inheriting from. And all of the nodes are going to inherit from node 3D, or should say all of the nodes that we're going to work with in this project are going to, not all actually do. And with that, though, comes the transform property. And within this property is where you can set position, rotation, and scale, among obviously a few other things. So position is going to set where this node lives in world space. So if you grab any one of these arrows and drag, you'll see the position changing in value. And then the same thing for kind of these circle ones. These are going to allow you to tweak the rotation. And then if you want to interact with the scale, actually any of these are up here, but if you want to interact with the scale, you can turn on scale mode and then this will turn into a box and you can drag. Or you can just set these properties directly in the inspector. Oops, not zero though. And we are actually out because it's trying to keep them uniform. So we'll turn off uniform. There we go. Uniform is actually normally pretty good to have. Okay, now that we have the ground created, let's get the player and the camera set up so that we can actually see what's going on in our scene. Now to do that, we're gonna make a separate scene to house them. So go to scene, new scene. And then again, it's gonna be 3D, so go ahead and pick that. And then rename this top node to player. Now what's really cool is sometimes you can add the wrong node to your scene. And changing it out is incredibly easy. So for player, we actually don't want a node 3D. We want a character body. So you can right click and go to change type and then type character body 3D. And you can see it here. Now, character body 3D is a really cool node type that allows you to more easily manipulate characters through scripts. It handles a lot of checks that you would kind of routinely do every time you're making an interactable character. So hit change. And you'll see here two things happen. First is the icon shifts. And then the second is that there's a warning. If you hover over, this warning is going to be effectively the same one that we just saw on the static body, which it's saying it doesn't know how to handle physics collisions because it has no shape tied to it. So just like the ground, we'll, we'll take care of that, but we're going to do it in a minute. So right click and once again, we're going to add a mesh instance 3D, which is going to be the visual representation of the player. And we'll call this body. And then come over into the inspector and instead of box, pick capsule mesh. I'm actually gonna change this to move. So now we have a body for the player, but it's kind of hard to tell what the forward direction is. And so a lot of people will kind of handle this a little bit differently. I've seen some people add kind of a cute little glasses in front of the face for whatever reason. I just like to add an arm that sticks out of the middle of the body. So that's what we're gonna do. So add another mesh instance. I uh, 3D, and then set that to uh, forward direction for the name. Pick box mesh, and then go ahead and click on this and let's set the properties. I think let's do, yeah, 0.25 for the X and the Y, and then one for the length. 
and you can click this to hide it away. And on the transform, let's check, set the position to be maybe negative 0.5 to stick part way out. And there we go. Now we have the arm sticking out the forward direction. And on that note, it's probably very important to take a pause and talk a little bit about Godot's coordinate system. So depending on if you're familiar with maybe 3D modeling or different engines, a lot of times they'll use kind of different coordinate systems. In Godot, uh, negative Z is forward. And you can kind of see for illustration where we're facing. So this right here is our negative Z, which is kind of where the arm is facing. Positive Z, positive Y, negative Y being down positive x, which would be kind of over on this side, and then negative x. Okay, so now that we've partially created the player, let's save it. So hit control s, and then enter. And let's actually solve the collision problem. So go ahead and add child node. And then once again, we're going to add a collision shape. And then for the shape instead, this time it's capsule. You can see once again that that blue bounding area pop up on the collider and then the air is now gone. So we're good because we didn't change the size of the capsule for the player's mesh. Everything kind of lined up without having to set the properties. Okay, so now that we have the player set up, let's get the camera added in. And the style of camera for this project or really this series is going to be a third person camera that follows the player around. Again, the nice thing about Godot is there's a specific node called the Spring Arm 3D, which is going to help make this a lot easier. So to start, let's actually add a pivot point. And we just need a regular node. And then this can be renamed to Camera Pivot. And under the Node 3D Transform, let's move the Y axis up to about 1.8. And that's just going to sit above the player. Okay, so what this is doing is it's kind of setting the height of where the camera is going to be at. And then it's going to also act as a bit of a focal point for adding rotation on the camera. Now, as a child of the pivot, let's add the spring arm 3D. And this node is super cool. It acts as a mounting point for the camera. So it creates basically a flexible camera arm that will automatically handle obstacles by maintaining kind of the proper distance from the player. So let's say you have the camera, maybe it's three, four meters behind the player. And as the player walks to a wall, instead of the camera being behind the wall, it'll actually move in on the player automatically so that the player's kind of always still in proper framing. Now, the only property that we need to set is the spring length. So before I change this value, if you look kind of closely, there's a, a light blue line that's kind of coming off of the pivot. If I change spring length to three, that blue line gets extended. The spring length defines the maximum distance that the camera can be from the parent. So when everything's fantastic, it'll be three meters away. Now the last thing that we're missing is the actual camera. So let's add a camera 3D. And you can see that gets added and it's kind of right at that pivot point rather than where we want it to be, which is the three meters away. When you go to run your game, this will uh, move the camera appropriately. Now, the only thing that we do want to change with the camera is the rotation. I want this to be at a negative 20 so that the camera is kind of back here and then looking down at the player. All right, so again, a control S to save. And let's come into our scene. Now we can take the player and drop the player as a child of level 01. You can see it's come into the scene. Now, if we pull the player up so that, oops, they're on the ground. It's snapping on for some reason there. You can see the player kind of sitting on the ground and then. A really handy way to tell when you've got a nested scene is it'll have this icon here. And if we click the icon, it'll actually open up that nested scene in a tab so that you can edit it.
Let's duplicate the player. And move it to the second one and just take a look at some of the power of having a reusable scene. So if I come over to the player and let's say for some reason, we really want the Y axis to be two. So it's elongated and hit control S. If I come over both of the players, because they're kind of pointed towards that same reusable scene instance have now uh, taken on that new property because we changed it in our primary scene. Now let's reset this back to one, save it. And we can come back, we can actually get rid of the second player so we don't need it. It's a one player game. And now that we've got the camera in, let's go ahead and hit play. Now this error happens the first time you go to run your scene on a new project. And it's basically just saying, you haven't defined what your starting scene is for a project. And it can be done in project settings. So if you ever set your starting scene, to one scene, you're like, ah, that's not the one I actually want. You just hop into project settings and change it. Uh, but what's nice is you can also from here just say, hey, select the current scene, and then that'll go and set that in your project settings. So it won't prompt you again. Okay, so you can kind of see the player's head right here and the ground, but it's really dark. And that's because there's no lighting in the scene. So let's go ahead and add that. Under level 01, add child node and type light and we can add the directional light 3D. So go ahead and hit create. And then if we pull back, if you pull this up, one, you can see two things happen. I pulled it up and the lighting didn't shift. And that's because it's kind of just like general directional lighting, hence the name. And you can see with these arrows that it's pointing uh, on the, the negative Z. So if we pull this up and over, just because that's what I like to do with my lights, and then turn this, uh, so you've got rotation. As you drag it, you can kind of see the light shifting depending on where the arrow is at. So like this could also be something really good for simulating day-night cycles. Now lighting is a highly complex subject that definitely deserves its own video. But what I'll leave you with is um, under the properties, there's a couple that you kind of want to play around with at a min bar. And one of those is, is the color, right? So let's say we're simulating the sun. Well, we'll probably want, for example, a light kind of yellow. This is very dark, but a light yellow kind of emittance. So I really encourage you to play around with these settings and see what they do. Um, and on that note, if you hover over any of these, you will get uh, nice documentation properties. Okay, so now that this light is in the scene, let's take a look and see if we can see anything. For your challenge, create a new reusable scene. Something like an obstacle that the player can't walk through. Drop it into your level scene and then see what happens. Try playing around with the different material settings on the mesh instance as well to see how those affect the rendering of your obstacle. And then in the next lesson, you're going to bring your player to life by learning the basics of scripting and then input handling to make it move.